So what's remarkable about what this chapter is highlighting is how we had everything broken down uh, from the fields, which we know were three components each, so that's six components. And when now we broke that down into finding the potentials, which is only four things to find, the three components from A and a one uh, component for the scalar potential. So we've made our job much easier and um, a way to continue this extrapolation process is by showing the Lorentz force in the potential form, which is actually really cool. Um, but when we're dealing with forces, we see that we get a uh, particular uh, result from mechanics, i.e. that the force is equal to the rate of change of the momentum. So we can write momentum in terms of the potentials and the force in terms of the potentials, and that's what we're going to start dealing with now. All right. Um, again, I will go ahead and put more notes in the description that uh, we can actually read through in detail, or you can read the book. But our statement for this particular problem reads, the vector potential for a uniform magnetostatic field is A equal negative one-half R cross B, Again, we've seen that before in chapter five. Show that dA dt is equal to negative one half v cross b. In this case, and confirm that uh, equation 10.20 holds or yields the correct equation of motion. All right, so the Lorentz force law. Again, since we uh, had to deal with things in terms of uh, the fields from the Lorentz force law, but we know that force is equal to the rate of change of uh, P, the momentum. We can write this in terms of the uh, time derivative. So we get d by dt P plus QA is equal to the negative gradient of Q V minus V dot A. And what is the, what we call the convective derivative because it kind of connects everything. Um, again, some weird words that are technical, I'll put in the description, but uh, this is dA by dt is equal to the partial dA dt plus the divergence of V multiplied into A. All right, let's see how to work with this stuff. So let's note here that A is independent of T and B is independent of R. Okay, if we go back to the potential here, um, so dA dt is equal to d by dt. That whole thing gets shoved to zero, right? Because A is independent of t. Clearly, B has to be independent of R because if A were to exist, then the cross product of R with R vector with B would go to zero because you can't have any overlapping components. They will sign out to zero. Um, but that being said, we still have a uh, V dot uh, del uh, all multiplied by negative one half r cross b okay so if you remember some of the work we had to do in chapters i think three definitely chapter one and maybe chapter five at least with the vector dotted with the del operator we see that uh we're gonna have to be a little careful in maneuvering with the vector calculus so Let's go ahead and take that negative one half out front, the dot product of V, which is VX with the del operator, which is that partial uh, operator. So we get uh, VX, DX, VY, DY, and VZ, DZ, okay? Now we have to multiply that parentheses into the vector brackets, which represent the curl of R and B, R being the spatial vector, B being some arbitrary field, okay? I use the angle brackets because right now, X hat, Y hat, Z hat is going to take too much space. Okay. But what we see is that we now have to distribute that parentheses into each component. So the parentheses in the X hat, the Y hat, and the Z hat. Okay. And then apply whatever derivatives are applicable. And our next step, we do that, but then we see that we still have an X hat or VX that needs to be factored out. In VX, anytime we see an X, uh, any position with x, like in y hat, we get negative x bz, so all we're left with after the derivative is negative bz y hat. Similarly, the other component is in uh, is by z hat. So we fact we apply the derivative to each component of the angle bracket and then factor out the uh, derivative component 
not the derivative, the velocity component that is equivalent or uh, factorable. So finally, in the last step, once we do that, then we just combine everything that goes into the x hat, y hat, and z hat directions, just because it's easier to clear out derivatives that way. Um, clearly, dx only applies to those who have an x. Everything else is a constant and goes away. Then we refactor based on the uh, angle, or not the angle, but the direction. So x hat, y hat, z hat. And if we see here, we're left with yet another curl. And this time it's the curl of V with B. So we are able to prove that DA DT is equal to negative one half V cross B. That's pretty cool. And also, in my opinion, what is to be expected? The only time to the only thing that's time sensitive here is uh, the rate of change of the position, which gives us the velocity. So it's pretty natural. But we just have to be careful with the formulistic approach or the formulistic approach to this thing. Now, the force law reads dp dt plus dqa over dt is equal to negative q gradient 0 minus uh, uh, v dot a, okay, because our scalar potential here was 0. Okay, so if we plug all these in, what we see here is that we get a q, and then we have da dt. So we factor the q out and just plug in the result we just found. And then on the other side, we go with the uh, a again as well, and we just plug in the negative one half r cross b. Clearly, we get some cancellations of the negative, and we have a lot of simplifying to do. So with that, uh, we take that force equation, we write db, dp dt, and then that one half from the uh, da, da dt uh, goes under q, so we have negative q over 2, b cross b, and then finally here we have negative q uh, over 2 uh, gradient of the v dot r cross b. So we have a triple product, and we just have to use a triple product rule here. Um, and so once we do that, we simply uh, take that v cross b, add it over, and we see here that after applying one of the triple, triple product rules, excuse me, that we can rearrange the order of v and b or uh, v and r and to do that we have to be very careful because we have to switch the order of b in order to keep the signs organized again that was a product rule you can look it up in the book or any other table if you want but for for this sake for simplifying i'm letting the vector c uh, be independent of position since i want b cross v um, and then you see in the next step we have the gradient of r dot c so we're just looking at a way to simplify this vector component wise down and we'll see that it sums up to what we expect so if i apply the derivative to every component of this dx we're only left with one component which is cx dy we're only left with one component in the y direction which is cy and then uh dz we're only left with one component cz so after all this is done, I'm only left with the vector C left, okay? Which is awesome because that tells me I can go back in and plug only B cross R or B cross V back in without the gradient having to worry. So we do that, but we notice that uh, since the cross product is anti-commutative, I could switch the order at the cost of a negative sign. So I put that negative sign in, they cancel out, and now I have uh, the same thing, but one half on each of them. So one half plus one half gives me a total of uh, one. So indeed, I'm left with dp dt is equal to q v cross b, which is exactly what we expect from the Lorenz force law. How freaking cool is that? All from the fact that we use potentials. So the potentials are just so darn useful, and that's what we're aiming to have in all our experiments, because then we could find everything else. Awesome.